going to wait one or two more minutes to allow for more people to join. along. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. My name is Diane Farron. I'm the vice president for clinical excellence and innovation at Chicanies and the clinical lead for Chicanies. And it's my great pleasure today that Chicanies is partnering with the New York State and New York City Departments of Health around today's webinar. Um, both Departments of Health have been really critical allies and in providing information and resources to our health centers of course, throughout the pandemic, but even prior to that, um, and we are grateful for their acknowledgement of health centers as critical access points um, to many, many people throughout New York State. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Diego Navarro and Dr. Coogan from the New York City and New York State Departments of Health, respectively, um, to share information today about important resources that they are bringing forth to health centers across the state. So, Elizabeth, to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. So, we are going to present a little bit uh, of information about the COVID-19 therapeutics that are available right now uh, to treat um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but just uh, to have a little of, uh, of background is that despite the ability of COVID-19 vaccines and other outpatient treatments, uh, the recent data has shown that uh, the Omicron surge uh, affected Black, uh, Black and African-American New Yorkers uh, that were hospitalized more than twice that the rate of white New Yorkers. Uh, this is the, it has been seen that there are uh, longer delays to in COVID-19 diagnosis among those ones that are 65 years old or older, uh, Bronx residents, uh, residents of lowest income neighborhoods and black and Hispanic New Yorkers. Uh, in addition, the, since the, in New York City, the um, oral antiviral program started through uh, Alto Pharmacy, the utilization has been lower in the Bronx and Queens with respect to their uh, share of cases. Um, some uh, recent uh, literature have shown that there have been lower rates of monoclonal antibody use among Black, Asian, and other race and Hispanic patients compared to white and non-Hispanic patients nationally. So uh, this, uh, uh, this, data, the, this data highlights the need to encourage early access uh, to care uh, and focus on ensuring equitable uh, prescribing and access to COVID-19 therapeutics. So just uh, some very visual uh, picture that shows uh, the treatments that are uh, right now authorized for COVID-19 are the antiviral pills, uh, two pills, uh, Munoporavir and Paxlovid, and monoclonal antibody treatment. This is a bit updated because it shows that you can use COVID-19 uh, uh, mo monoclonal antibodies to for an exposure to COVID-19, but this is no longer uh, authorized due to lack of activity against Omicron. Uh, this is the, a schematic view that highlights all the therapeutics developed so far, including the antiviral therapies uh, and immune modulators, which are uh, indicated for patients who are hospitalized and admitted to the ICU. Recently, Remdesivir uh, has been also authorized for outpatient use. Uh, the advantage of the monoclonal antibody therapy and of the oral antivirals is that uh, they are able to target patients who have been recently diagnosed with COVID-19 and it's early enough in their disease progression that providing the treatment as an outpatient could be preventing hospitalizations, ICU admissions and ED visits. Um, the, the picture includes the Paxlovid and Munoporavir, the oral antiviral, Sotrovimab, that is a monoclonal antibody, uh, antibody and the, uh, last Friday, a new uh, monoclonal antibody, Beptelovimab, was authorized by the FDA for treatment. Uh, till the Omicron wave, uh, we had also monoclonal antibody therapy available 
for those that were exposed or that have an asymptomatic infection, but uh, this is no longer uh, available as those two types of products, the uh, uh, Regeneron products and the Valanivimab and the Sevimab are not longer active against uh, the Omicron variant. There is also a therapy that is available for prevention, that is Ebushel, uh, and this is uh, indicated for people who cannot uh, get vaccinated or are not expected to mount an adequate immune response to the vaccines. And for further information, you can visit uh, the NIH treatment guidelines. So this is the overview of the different COVID-19 outpatient treatment options, the monoclonal antibodies, oral antivirals, the IV antivirals, that is the remdesivir, and the pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, monoclonal antibodies the, and the IV antivirals uh, and the pre-exposure prophylaxis are administered um, uh, IV, this, this two IV, and this is by injection, and the pills are given orally. And, uh, for these three, uh, the, um, they are, these two are for people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and are, are, had, are, are at the highest risk for severe illness for COVID-19. Uh, they must be started uh, within seven or 10 days uh, of symptoms onset, depending on the monoclonal antibody, or within five days of symptom onset for the oral antivirus. Um, so, Trovimab has been shown an efficacy of uh, 79% preventing uh, severe uh, disease or hospitalization or death. death. Uh, Paxlovid, uh, an 88% of uh, redu risk reduction for hospitalization and death, uh, while Munoporavir, uh, a 30%. Uh, Rendesivir as an outpatient has been shown to, pre to reduce the risk to 87% uh, and Ebushield is able to reduce uh, the risk of symptomatic infection by 77%. Uh, the data of clinical efficacy of betelomimab is not yet available, but um, for some, uh, given some preclinical data uh, and comparison with the other monoclonal antibodies, is expected to have uh, um, uh, efficacy, but they are working on the clinical trial. So, selecting the right therapeutic um, uh, has several factors that are going to affect the selection of the best treatment. Uh, and this is the clinical efficacy. As I have seen, as I have shown, there are differences on the type of um, monoclonal antibody or oral therapy, the availability of the treatment option, and the feasibility of administering uh, parenta, parenteral uh, medication. So, so trovimab, remdesivir, and betolovimab uh, has to be given um, intravenously. These two via infusion and this uh, betolovimab by an IV push. Uh, regarding the oral antivirals, Paxlovid, uh, as there are, there is, it has ritonavir in their um, ingredients. There is a potential for significant drug-to-drug -drug interactions uh, and uh, also the efficacy against circulating variants. The, the ones that I have presented right now, they are expected to have efficacy against um, uh, Omicron. Uh, regarding the contraindications for Paxlovid, uh, the therapy is contraindicated for uh, patients uh, that have a history of hypersensitivity reactions to any of their active ingredients or who are on drugs that are highly dependent on the CYP3A uh, protease for clearance uh, and uh, or uh, drugs that are potent uh, inducers of these uh, proteins. Uh, and there are, uh, for some of the examples for the first part is amiodarone, sorry, I cannot pronounce, amiodarone, uh, warfarin, phenotin, statins, OCPs, or several others. And for inducers is certain HIV and hepatitis C antivirals. 
Um, the fact sheet for healthcare providers for the Paxlovid contains information of the list of medicines, but there is also an additional guidance that has been developed by the University of Liverpool, where uh, providers can check drug-to-drug uh, -to -drug interactions in the, in the tool, and it gives you uh, if it is possible to take one of the drug uh, if the patient is already taking another. Uh, the th in addition, the therapy is not recommended. Uh, so this is something else. The therapy is not recommended for patients who have severe kidney disease or uh, their the EGFR less than less than thirty milliliters per minute or that have a liver impairment, uh, the child pack class C. And there are some dos dosage adjustments uh, needed for patients with moderate renal impairment. Uh, and also, uh, it has to be noted that Paxlovid may risk to H HIV-1 uh, resistant um, to HIV protease inhibitors in patients with uncontrolled or undiagnosed uh, HIV-1 infection. Um, but patients that are already in Ritonavir or in COVID-19 that uh, containing HIV or HCV regimen should not continue their treatment as indicated, and there is no need to have any um, uh, um, dosage adjustments. Regarding the monoporavir, uh, monoporavir should be prescribed for patients who are 80 years, uh, 18 years old or older, uh, for whom there is no an alternative FDA-authorized COVID-19 treatment uh, available that is accessible or clinical appropriate. So it means that uh, it is uh, given as a second uh, line um, drug. In addition, there are uh, additional considerations. Uh, Mulnoporavir is not recommended during pregnancy, and if a pregnant individual chooses to receive Mulnoporavir, uh, there is a program, the Pregnancy Surveillance Program, established by Merck to monitor pregnancy outcomes on those individuals. Um, uh, additionally, uh, prescribers should advise uh, that it is not recommended during breastfeeding, uh, during the treatment, and for four days after finishing the treatment. Uh, and they should advise that women that are that have childbearing potential, uh, they should have they should use effective and consistent contraception uh, during the treatment and for four days after. Uh, Additionally, in men of reproductive uh, age and potential who are sexually active with women uh, of childbearing potential should use a reliable and effective and consistent contraception uh, uh, during treatment and for three months after the last dose. Uh, regarding the monoclonal antibodies, uh, sotrovimab and beptelovimab, uh, they are the only ones that are currently authorized for treatment of Omicron. Um, this is due because Regeneron uh, and Balanibimab with Etesibimab are no longer authorized due to their lack of activity against this variant. Uh, and Betelovimab has demonstrated efficacy against the Omicron BA.1 BA and BA.2 sublineages, while Sotrovimab has been demonstrated efficacy against the BA.1 sublineage, and they are working on activity against the BA.2 sublineage. Um, they are indicated for patients who are 12 years old or older and who weigh uh, more than 40 kilograms or more than 88 uh, pounds. They have to have a positive COVID-19 diagnostic test, either a molecular test or an, a, an antigen test um, done via a laboratory or a, a home test. Um, and patients should be at high risk for progressing to severe COVID illness. Um, the, the monoclonal antibody treatment is given uh, through one-time intravenous infusion for sotrovimab or via an IV push for beptelovimab. But after the um, uh, after the uh, administration, they have to patients should be observed for one hour. Um, uh, they must be administered within seven 
or 10 days, depending on the antibody, uh, of symptoms onset. But it has to be a reminder, the most important point is that they are more effective the sooner that they are administered after a positive COVID-19 test result. And for more information about uh, including the exclusion criteria, you can visit the COVID-19 provider treatment uh, webpage at the DOHMH. Regarding the monoclonal antibodies that uh, are indicated for pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, they are uh, authorized for people who are 12 years old or older. They weigh at least 88 pounds. They are not currently infected with SARS-CoV-2. They have no known recent exposure to an, an individual infected with the virus, or, and they should be either a moderate to severe immunocompromise due to a medical condition or to being receiving immunosuppressive medications of treatments uh, that uh, um, they may no, not mount an adequate immune response to COVID-19 vaccination. Or, in addition, there could be a, um, a people who uh, could not be yet vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine due to a history of severe adverse reaction, uh, such an uh, uh, allergic reaction to a vaccine or to any of its com uh, components. Um, there is, um, HHS uh, has a treatment locator to find every shell and uh, uh, the oral antivirals uh, that is linked here, uh, the COVID-19 therapeutics locator. Uh, and you could access to see which facilities have supplies on hand for any of these products. Uh, in addition, uh, HNH has put a decision support tool for providers it hasn't been objected yet to include betelovimab in the um, landscape, but it will help uh, providers to uh, to decide which of these monoc uh, the monoclonal antibodies or the oral therapeutics are more appropriate for patients. Uh, regarding the distribution of the oral antivirals in New York City. Uh, the initial supplies of Paxlovid and Monoporavir uh, have been purchased uh, by the federal government and are allocated to states for free. Uh, the, before, uh, despite um, very limited supplies for oral antivirals uh, when their distribution started in December, the current supplies of Paxlovid uh, are improving but we need to focus on, a, on ensuring an equitable access for the highest risk, risk outpatients. Um, currently in New York City, the oral medications are only distributed through one pharmacy partner, that is Alto Pharmacy, uh, that delivers uh, the medication to the patient's residents across all five boroughs at no cost to patients. Um, any licensed prescribing in New York City can order oral antiviral for any eligible patient in the city uh, via the e-prescribe uh, system or calling uh, or by phone or fax. Uh, and once that the prescription is received by Alto, patients can schedule the delivery on the Alto Pharmacy mobile app or by text or by phone. And prescriptions that are confirmed, confirmed by 5 p.m. on weekdays or 1 p.m. on weekends are delivered to patients' preferred address on the same day. And in addition, the pharmacy has counseling for patients and providers in more than 100 uh, languages. And uh, New York City uh, uh, released um, a health alert uh, for with more deta details. But we can you can access to this information in our webpage. So now to Lindsay, to my colleague. Thank you, Elizabeth. So the distribution of oral antivirals in New York State outside of New York City is um, a little bit different. We are partnering with many federal retail pharmacy partners, independent pharmacies, as well as now, this site's a little bit outdated, we, all, we also have started partnering with long-term care pharmacies and hospital pharmacies as well as access points. Um, we continue to push product out. Um, there's uh, two to three pharmacy sites per county, but we're continually rolling on new sites. In the beginning, we really wanted to prioritize communities within, within each county with a high Medicaid population. 
we understand, you know, there are challenges with traveling long distances, especially when you're looking at some regions of, of upstate New York, that that catchment area can be very broad. Um, so we are consist constantly looking for ways to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our most vulnerable um, populations. And as supplies increase, we are continually rolling on new partners. Next slide. So, as Ellie mentioned, there is a COVID-19 therapeutics locator tool here available, and we've included the link. And I'll let you go ahead and speak to this slide, Ellie, if that's okay. Uh, no, yeah. Think, okay. You want me to keep going? Yeah, I okay. got Great. Yeah, so yes, with the locator, you can put any address in the search tool and it will give you the facilities that are located within uh, that zip code or city that you are looking for and it will give you uh, information about how many course, uh, courses were allotted to that uh, particular facility and how many of them they were are already on hand and they can be uh, prescribed to or yeah, be administered to patients. Yeah. So now uh, we would like just uh, to focus that uh, it would be a really great uh, opportunity to expand uh, the access to, uh, for FQHCs uh, to oral antivirals, because we have seen that there, ha there has been a low utilization of oral antivirals than expected, especially for Paxlovid. Uh, they initially, the demand uh, was much higher than the supply, but now uh, this is balancing out uh, as cases and hospitalizations are declining. So, the next step would be for enrolling FQHCs as distribution, distribution points. We think that uh, you are key partners to improve the uptake among high priority populations. And the goal is to reduce those barriers to accessing timely to treatment if the therapies are available where patients come for testing and routine care. So this is the uh, showing the importance of the COVID-19 outpatient therapeutics treatment cascade. So uh, it is important that the patients, uh, once they did, uh, they develop symptoms, they get tested right away to see if what it is causing the causing those symptoms is COVID-19. And uh, after the there is a clinical assessment, uh, there there could be patients could be referred either for the oral antivirals or for the monoclonal anti antibodies. And they will be receiving uh, these treatments that will be reducing their risk for hospitalizations and death. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination has, uh, has shown uh, that FQHCs are key access points uh, to promote the access uh, for people. And they have a, a, a role on the equitable access to therapeutics. Uh, and uh, FQHCs uh, have contributed enormously to increasing vaccination rates among uh, black and brown New Yorkers. And as it is shown here, uh, 80, um, the population, BIPOC population was 80% in FQCs compared with other hospitals. Uh, and this is the health and hospital system in New York City. So uh, the role that FQCs could happen to ensure an equitable access is uh, very important and ha can have a huge impact to to increase the access to these important medications for uh, BIPOC populations. Now, Lindsay, yeah. Great, thank you. So, it, you know, here we are. Sort of, we would we would love to hear more from you all, and we'll stop talking and take questions here soon. But I want to just kind of walk through how, if you are interested in receiving oral antivirals and or Evashield or any of our other maps, we're asking you all to complete the survey. And there was a link to the survey in the email announcement that included the meeting for today. So if you haven't filled that out yet, um, I would just ask that you click that link and um, send us some information. So that'll be a, a, an excellent starting point. If you're interested in oral antivirals or Evashield, 
please do fill out that survey. This is going to be a starting point for us and we're asking for some information in that survey that we would need to start um, onboarding your particular site. Um, if you're already a current monoclonal antibody provider and you already have information in our HHS partner ordering portal system, you will receive an email um, and and if we have all of your information up to date, this will be relatively seamless for us to bring you on and then start to allocate product. If you're not a current monoclonal antibody provider, we're going to just gather a couple of additional pieces of information from you. And we have a process established through our website that um, it's a form where we gather some information about your 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 shipping info, your shipping information, your site location. Um, we ask for information about your pharmacy license, all of the stuff that we would need to provide to the wholesaler who would eventually be shipping and distributing this information to you. So we'll start there and then um, again, oh, now you can go ahead yeah, to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, That's okay. perfect. So um, we will, we are gonna continue to send out the oral antivirals using a push system for now. Um, future allocations, we, and even now we've started tailoring some of our pushes based on how much people use. So if we see a site using um, over 50% of what we send them, we will send them another another push. If we see sites start to slow down, only use a full a couple of patient courses, um, anything up to 20% of their utilization, we'll often reach out and just check with the site before we push out additional product. Oral antivirals are on a two week cycle. So every two weeks we get an amount from the federal government, which we then distribute. Um, two sites. So there's a little bit of time in between there where we can gather some feedback, um, look at who's using what, and then do some outreach. There is a daily reporting requirement in our, we call it our HPOP, similar to the VPOP system if you've used that previously. There is a daily reporting requirement for our oral antivirals. And again, this helps us determine where the need is, as well as that is what feeds that oral, the therapeutics locator that, that Ellie showed you. So that information is critically important for folks to understand where to send patients, where to go to know where product is available. There is an option where we can also um, make your site not public. So if you're not um, a site that would like to have that displayed on, on the website, we can certainly have that conversation with you all. And I'm not sure how first I handled that. I believe I do see um, at the FQHC sites on the therapeutics locator now who are receiving product. And again, this is, this is not the same as the HRSA um, program. We know that they were able to push out product to some, but not all. So what we're hoping to do is, is um, gather feedback from you all on, on the sites that have not been chosen yet, but are looking for more product, looking for an opportunity to have this product on hand. Similarly, Evashield is also allocated using a push system. We tend to stick with smaller doses of this particular one at first, say a minimum shipping order of 24, just to see how it goes. Let folks get used to using the product, um, ascertain and identify the population within their healthcare system that would be eligible for this. There's a similar reporting requirement for Evashield. Again, this daily reporting requirement is used by us and both the federal government in ascertaining how much product is being used, where the greatest need is, and they are looking to use these utilization numbers to kind of start to shift product to different states where there may be a greater need. For Evershield, what we'll do is after that first initial push, we'll reach out to you. We have a weekly survey that's sent to providers to indicate, you know, do you want more product? Do you want us just to hold for now? Do you have enough? Um, and we, we have that on a weekly cycle. It opens on Thursday, and then we ask that by Monday, you just get back to us and let us know if you'd like more product for the following week. The next slide um, gets into a little bit of storage and handling. So the oral antivirals can be stored at room temperature. Paxlovid comes in a full course per package, 30 tablets. There are some minimum order quantities, 20 for Paxlovid and 24 for Malnopovir. Evashield, re refrigeration is required. It's packaged as two vials in one carton, and the minimum order quantity is 24. Next slide.
Ellie, can you, oh, perfect, thank you. So I mentioned this in the previous slide, but I'll say it just one more time. After that initial allocation data, we'll be looking at the information that you're reporting on a daily basis to help us determine where we should be sending more product, where we should be not sending as much product. And again, sites are required to adhere to this daily reporting requirement. It supports the product finder tool, the therapeutics locator tool. It informs the federal government as well as lets us know um, where we need to be focusing. So with that, Ellie, am I, am I, I think I'm pushing it back to you, correct? Yes, yes. So here is a picture of supporting documents with more information about the monoclonal antibodies uh, and the oral therapeutics developed uh, by uh, both the New York City and New York State. Uh, and we are updating the documents to include also the latest uh, changes in recommendations or if they are new products um, uh, authorized uh, and they are posted in our website, but also the New York State has a similar uh, web page with uh, uh, COVID-19 therapeutics. And Lindsay, do you want, uh, or I can... So, the conclusion is that uh, therapeutics are key tools on our arsenal to combat uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. So, it, this is a great um, infographic developed by Dr. Ian McKay, where it shows that in order to be fully protected for COVID-19 disease, we need like a layer prevention strategies that are key for minimizing the impact of uh, Omicron or future uh, variants. So there are uh, some uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, something that is uh, more uh, related to ventilation, uh, quarantine and isolation, the vaccines, and now the, it would be pills and the um, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we are posting some additional resources our therapeutics webpage, the New York State therapeutics uh, information for uh, our webpage with information for provider, the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines that uh, it is um, updated uh, frequently uh, when more data comes available. Uh, there is the ASPER uh, therapeutics clinical implementation guide that will have information um, for providers on how to start uh, or implementing a program to distribute uh, COVID-19 therapeutics. And there, uh, there is the side-by-side -side overview of the different or outpatient therapeutics developed at the h and yes, HHS. Um, so with this, we are here now open to take any more questions that you will have uh, regarding these um, therapeutics. And I believe you are able to unmute yourself in the presentation, or you can, I don't know if you can put also questions in the chat. If you think, uh, yes, posting or asking a question, do you think if you are not willing to start this type of distribution within your center, what are the, um, uh, the barriers that you think uh, for adopting it, if there are any? Ellie, I wonder if we should just do a mic check and make sure that folks can unmute themselves. If someone would just help us out and just unmute yourself and just speak so we know that, because we're not hearing anything and I just want to make sure people are not talking. So, Lindsay, can you hear me? I yes. can hear you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so, yes, uh, and thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, 
Uh, I'm Gene Heslin. I'm the first Deputy Commissioner of Health for New York State, for those that don't know me on the phone. And I want to thank everybody for, you know, listening in today about this and, and both Lindsay and Ellie for doing the uh, presentations. Um, we at the state think that this is really important. Um, as safety net providers, uh, the community health centers and FQHCs really provide a, a necessary service and at point of care. And so the commissioner and I today had a discussion about how are we going to get people to use these medications more and how are we going to get them to people faster? And so we're going to be developing a campaign to go out to all providers that provide <coughs> care uh, uh, to think about at the time of testing to write their prescriptions. Uh, one step further is you people that have 340B pharmacies, uh, we, we really want to see um, supplies available in the 340B pharmacies to decrease the access uh, in terms of people having to go to a second place. You know, we're dealing with challenged populations. Sometimes they're undocumented, uh, and these are people that uh, have so much risk um, just getting to your facilities for care um, that um, we think that this is incredibly important. The other thing I will say is this doesn't preclude you from having a clinician write a prescription and go to one of the other pharmacies in the community. It's not an either or. This is an and. This is not uh, meant to be um, um, uh, for, you know, just that's it. Uh, again, this is an and. And so we'd like you to think about it. We understand that anytime you add a new medication, you know, obviously your pharmacists have to come up to speed. Um, theoretically, your EHR already should have the drug-drug interactions in it because if you're already prescribing it to people in the community, um, you should have some of those understandings already there. So hopefully it's not too much of a lift for the pharmacies. The other thing is, and, 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 and we don't talk about it, and thankfully Omicron is on its way down, but we anticipate there may be another bug, you know, after this one, right? Uh, another variant coming along. And so while it's quiet, uh, or quieter, uh, we're hoping to get these things in place and structures in place to make sure we have hardened distribution systems to support communities. I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Heslin. And, and um, this is Dr. Mary Foote from New York City Department of Health, um, Medical Director for the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, just kind of continue on this theme that Dr. Heslin started, um, you know, in terms of how important it is, you know, to have you know, just for this place based approach that we're really striving for in terms of serving our communities, um, you know, during COVID and, you know, in day to day life, you know, it's, I think it's, it's such a wonderful service, you know, that you provide for your communities that you serve and to make this sort of a 1 stop shop where patients, you know, go to care where they trust the care that they get. They can get their testing with you, you know, especially now that HRSA will be, you know, offering, you know, opening up ordering for free tests for you to order. You know, it can be really a one stop shop for COVID care. If somebody is sick, you know, they can go into the, your. To their FQHC where they normally receive care, you know, them get their testing and then walk out with their medication. And I think that's just a, you know, a really nice way to, to really. You know, serve the health of our communities. So I'm going to pitch out. Anybody have any thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Ellie talked about barriers, but just any thoughts about is there a way that we can start to uh, collaborate or at least enter into the discussion about how to uh, move this forward?
Or maybe if uh, one of our colleagues from Chicanies um, has anything to add about feedback you've been getting from your your community um, of of members about you know therapeutics or any challenges that they've they've expressed. Hi everyone, it's Diane Farron again. Um, we we have heard from health centers who are, who are distributing these drugs. Um, some health centers are receiving them from from the federal government directly. Um, the only real concerns I've heard is you know understanding who these medications should be used with cautiously or where it's contraindicated. But um, I mean that's sort of standard medical practice. So I haven't heard any specific concerns about linking into and distributing them beyond that. But again, we will continue, um, of course, to distribute this information through all our various venues so we can distribute it through email. Um, we will continue to bring it up anytime we are convening our health centers. Um, as since I view this as sort of the introductory um, discussion with the city and state on this, and we will, of course, continue to uh, to promote and bring people into the fold. I, I just add one final thing, um, at least the most recent final thing until this, the next final thing. Um, the uh, there are no shortages. We have a ton and a half of this stuff. I just pulled up today's website uh, for the locator. We've got almost 8,000 doses of Paxlovid available throughout the state. We've got 32,000 doses of Lemipavir, 8,500 of Evasheld. And I know that we're putting about 3,000 doses, 3,000, no, 3,500 doses or so of Citrovimab and Batevimab, uh, Batelovimab um, um, uh, out into the community. Uh, this week, uh, we're 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 uh, putting that out. So there is no shortage. You know, you should do what you do in medicine: a good history and physical. Think about what the issues are, patient in front of you. If they're appropriate, um, you should be prescribing it. Yeah, and we we really hope that these therapeutics, you know, become just standard practice, standard of care when it comes to, you know, seeing any patient with risk factors, um, you know, like Tamiflu, um, you know, they come in, it's not just about, you know, and I think, I think it's important for us to, you know, get our messaging, maybe a little more patient relevant as well from, from, from the public health side, but it really is not, you know, I mean, obviously we care about the hospitalizations and deaths that are averted, you know, by these you know, really powerful medications, but, you know, also there's data to say that it makes people feel better and it makes them feel better faster. Um, and that might also be a way to discuss it with your patients who come in feeling pretty yucky, you know, that that's another, you know, communication tool. So it's, you know, if they may not quite perceive themselves as, as at risk for the hospitalization or death, but if they feel really bad, that might be what kind of gets them over the finish line in terms of accepting it. Right, I guess if there's no last call for questions or feedback. Well, thank you so much um, to our partners at Chicanies for for bringing us all together today and, and for everybody for taking time on your Thursday afternoon to join us. Um, and, you know, we always value our partnerships with the federally qualified health center community. So please, you know, please, please, please reach out to us with any questions, anything we can do to support you, um, you know, in terms of therapeutics or any other, you know, COVID related question or, or concern. So we're, we're here for you. Great. So, and thank so you, Mary, much. for putting in the chat box. So if folks don't have it, we have a BML set up for at the health department. It's COVID-19 therapeutics at health.ny.gov. So if you have any questions, please do reach out and we'll, we will triage and get you to the right place. Thank you again for bringing these important resources to us. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you.